Hey, Dan. Hello, hello. Hey, hello, hello. hey Dan. Hey, Mark. All right. How's awesome. it going? Good, good. All right. Awesome. So the time on deck is 1,450 hours, which means we've got our fifth and final uh, panel uh, today with um, Joe Twer, who is uh, at Blue Snap, and Mark Ostroniak. Chief Sales Officer at Big Commerce. I probably butchered his last name. You didn't nail it, Dan. Nailed I did it. nail it. <laughs> no, but it's fine. No. <laughs> I'm super, I'm super yeah. good. It's been a long, you know, long, I don't long know, webinar man. for Dan. You know, my parents anglicized their Eastern European name. I don't know what the rest of you guys are. I know. I got stuck with like O and a bunch of letters. I mean, I could have been, <laughs> it could have been anything. Get it together. Mine was yeah. a lot longer than Twer. Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Good. All right. Well, so yes, we are joined here by Joe and Mark um, from Blue Snap and Big Commerce, uh, respectively. Um, we're very, very, very excited to have um, two heavy hitters in the field, you know, joining us uh, for our final panel on a Friday afternoon, taking you into the weekend. Um, we think that this. Um, uh, panel is going to be especially relevant really for everybody who who might want to join um, because most everyone will be in some form of e-commerce uh, industry or, or sort of ancillary kind of uh, thing and then we're also selling to one another back and forth um, business to business um, and so I think you know f we all each the three of us have our own personal experiences as B2B salespeople um, using, you know, uh, technology enablement tools as well as, um, you know, e-commerce, you know, um, both in our jobs and, and obviously, you know, as, as, as consultants looking to, you know, either help implement or, or, or advance, you know, a particular business's e-commerce e scheme. Um, so I think this is going to be a, a really a great conversation. Uh, one that I will frame this way. Um, if you are a B2B sales professional, um, and I had this conversation with, with both Joe and Mark, you know, 25 years ago or so, you would probably have carried on your your day-to-day -day responsibilities with a phone, um, maybe a desktop computer, um, and, you know, a notebook, right? But it would be a relatively, you know, uh, Spartan technology from a technology point of view existence. Um, 20 years ago, we start seeing the advent of, you know, um, sort of, you know, robust CRM tools and, you know, uh, you know, different sorts of uh, sales and, you know, enablement and tracking tools for, for customers. You know, this, the salesperson obviously becomes, um, you know, a technology user. And then, you know, over time, we've seen, you know, technology grow uh, in a B2B sales professional's life uh, exponentially. Um, having gone from just like the phone and the computer to now where you've got maybe three or four different applications running off of your phone and your computer. You're running a couple uh, applications to simply track um, your, your, your phone and computer, keystrokes and so on. Um, you know, volume of calls on a daily basis and, you know, automating, you know, contact generation and reporting and, and any of the things. And so, you know, um, a B2B sales professional who, you know, um, 30 years ago might have just been sort of looking to, um, you know, kind of have like a face-to-face, peer-to-peer traveling about, you know, um, either regionally or nationally or, or something, um, has become, we'll say, more and more confined to you know the office and the cubicle um, really being able to do their full job without really having to leave the four walls of, of the office and that's come with some you know cultural uh, pushback from from b2b folks who I would just assume would see b2b e-commerce in some instances maybe many um, as kind of just like the next evolution of this 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 technology this technology creep encroachment you know, in, into their lives. And so, you know, what we're asking here is, is that true, right? Is e-commerce and e-commerce tools, are they tools of obviation or are they tools of enablement, right? Um, is there a working synthesis that can be found? Is there really any reason that a B2B sales professional should be, um, we'll say, hostile to, to e-commerce tools? Um, you know, are there particular products, 
um, or industries writ large that might not benefit from, from e-commerce enablement. Um, to what extent can we sell anything under the sun, you know, via technology? And to what extent must we have uh, human involvement? Um, you know, from my own experience, being a B2B sales guy, I'm going to say not much because I'm the dumbest guy in the room nine times out of ten. So you're going to have to explain to me the value I provide and then um, and then we can go from there. But, um, you know, that's just a sort of long framing of, of what I hope is, a you know, and I know is going to be an interesting conversation. And I'll kick it over uh, first to Joe uh, Tour from Blue Snap to give his opening remarks, um, sort of frame the discussion from from his point of view and give his thoughts on, just what we're describing, the uh, the future of e-commerce tools in B2B and what that portends for the B2B professional themselves. Cool. Thanks, Dan. And uh, it's good to be here, I guess, late on a, on a Friday afternoon. I think we're the, the final session in this uh, um, great um, webinar you that you better make it together. good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you. I've been watching. I've been jumping in uh, when I can, Dan. You've been working hard, and um, <laughs> you know, obviously, a lot of uh, a lot of effort went into uh, putting together a great lineup of um, of sessions with awesome speakers and companies. Uh, great ideas. Uh, I've been trying to watch while I'm following along with the French Open. Um, and, and then, you know, there's also a little bit of work to be done, um, on, 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 uh, as well here, but anyhow, I, I'm, uh, sales for blue snap. Blue snap is a next generation, uh, a global payment processor, uh, where we work closely with trellis. We work closely with big commerce and a lot of the other companies that have been, um, in the midst here. And I guess as part of being a next generation, uh, fintech platform, we better think of more modern ways to sell and more and use more modern tools uh, that ultimately, you know, help us grow and win market share. And uh, I'm excited to kind of debate um, where all of that and these tools in e-commerce and open source kind of takes you and then where maybe myself and my team might need to get involved in and pick things up and, and run the ball into the end zone, so to speak. Uh, the nature of payments and payment processing, uh, because there's money movement involved, I would say that, you know, maybe um, on the bigger uh, the bigger deals, uh, the bigger projects uh, with the larger you know, billion dollar, multi-billion dollar, multinational uh, enterprise customers, their treasury and finance team probably at that end stage wants to have some more handholding related to the contract and confirming that the funds are going to hit their existing bank accounts and things like that. So there, there is a, an aspect of, of sort of what we do where Maybe you need to have human interaction uh, at some point, but anyhow, um, happy to to kind of talk about this and and um, you know uh, share my experiences and and thoughts with uh, with both of you guys. Great, thank you so much, Joe. <clears throat> and Mark, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear your opening remarks, and then you know uh, what, if any, response, you know, uh, anything you'd like to expound upon in, in Joe's opening statement. Um, and otherwise, I'll have some questions and some follow up after your opening remarks. But sounds uh, good. Well, well, I think uh, I think Joe and I agree on standing to the answer. Uh, in the chat. <laughs> so I think we we can start on a good foot. Well, uh, we're we're not out in we're not out and about anymore, Mark. To hand out business cards, to, I, I know. You know, to know. to walk around uh, Manhattan and uh, at least get our activity in. So I keep I keep doing the Vegas. You know, slapping the uh, the card in my hand, and it just doesn't work with my kids the same way. So. That's right. That's right. Awesome. Well, uh, glad to be here, Dan. Thanks for hosting and having us on. Uh, Joe, great to see you. Uh, uh, great format for the uh, debate today, and and I think it's a really really cool event. Um, so I run Sales for Big Commerce. We're an e-commerce platform. If you're not familiar with us, uh, our our entire business is having an open SaaS platform for e-com, intentionally flexible, intentionally integrated with kind of best-in-class partners like uh, Blue Snap, and uh, and our mission is to help merchants grow. And so this topic of B two B is something that that I'm obviously personally interested in, meaning it's my job, right? Selling products B two B, but it's also the the teams that uh, that I lead live, live this life, 
right, of, of trying to sell products. And then when we talk to merchants, I think this is where this topic becomes even more uh, acute, is this idea of is e-commerce a threat to the traditional sales model, the territory, the rep, the quota, right, the production that is classically done with a human being and a bag and a phone, right, and, and some type of price list going out with their catalog and shopping it. And, and here's my supposition to that is that, uh, that it is not at all a threat, it's actually an enabler, right? And so if you think about the things that we push ourselves and our sales teams to do, it's to go find value for the product or service that we're selling. Right? And, and that if you can find value for what it is you're selling, you can win business, you can command a premium in the market, and you can be competitive. And I think that, that e-commerce, people are often taking the context of what you think in the consumer vibe, right? Meaning, am I gonna take this B2B product and make it a self-serve, one-click, buy-on-demand product like you might on Amazon? And the reality is, unlikely, right? Great if you can, right? Good for you, right? If you can switch your business and it can be transactional and you can open up this entire new channel and move that way, the reality is often our products are complex enough that it takes a little more work to do that. And and I kind of laugh with my kids about it, right? Because I'm like, you know, the, the reason I can stay in business is because even with all the advent of technology and even maybe when we're in the low sophistication of AI now, that all the data we have, all the tools we have, uh, it still takes a human being to sell a lot of these products. And, and the question is, well, why, right? Like if I have a great product and I price it fairly, it shouldn't people just buy it, right? That's like the engineer's dilemma. It's like, man, I, I can build this great product and, and as long as I price it fairly, shouldn't it just sell itself? And, and the answer is no. And, and the question is why, right? And what if that can be automated? And when we talk about e-commerce, what we're talking about automating are the more transactional steps of a sales cycle, right? This is the thing like, this is entering an order this is calculating pricing. This is checking the status, right? And, and that's very different than building a solution. And maybe that sounds kind of like a, you know, a cliche term, right? Everybody talks about solution selling and what it means to build a solution and all these things. But, but in reality, that's, that's what it takes to solve a higher order business problem with a client and then enable them to buy that or uh, transact that product in an easier way. And so my thesis to this is that e-commerce isn't a threat at all. In fact, if you do it well, it should be enabling those sales teams and salespeople to actually do more. And, and whether it means the individual is doing more, meaning you now have more capacity to take on additional accounts, or it may be the business doing more, meaning the scale of uh, a business that's heavily B2B is more about opening new territories and new regions than it is necessarily turning on new channels. It doesn't mean that there aren't new channels, but meaning often it's if I can add new states, new territory, physical territory to take that product out, I can do really well. So anyway, I'll start there and glad to be on. Thank you guys so much. <clears throat> so yeah, so we we look at you know enablement versus obviation, right? And you know the 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 kind of the the worry is there or the you know the potential pain point but it's like how is how how does one you know assuage those fears right um, and and I'm gonna use an example of and we run into this a lot and, you know what Trellis does aside from sort of traditional e-commerce, you know, design development, you know, a lot of front end stuff is we work on the back end a lot and, you know, developed as a firm um, primarily, you know, as a kind of, you know, Magento engineering, you know, shop, um, heavy B2B e-commerce. And so, you know, I'm going to describe just in 30 seconds, a traditional trellis prospect for, for, for B2B. Um, and I'm going to use, you know, I'm going to, like it's me. So I'm the fourth generation owner, right? Yeah. Fourth generation owner of Crowther's electrical supply 
from you give me a <laughs> everyone always chooses Wisconsin or Minnesota or some like Weehawken, some some crazy place. Okay, now it's on me because it's fallen to me. For to sure, it's it. Scranton. Yeah. Or Scranton. For or sure. Scranton. <laughs> Definitely in Scranton. Okay, so I'm fourth generation owner of this business, right? And I myself have graduated a master's in business administration from the University of Scranton. And, you know, now I've, you know, taken over my great grandfather's company and I'm trying to bring it into the, the 21st century. And I've got, you know, Teddy and Phil and Dom and, the you know, the million, you know, sale, field sales reps that we have that have been hawking this stuff for, for 30 years apiece. They've got just an incredible amount of domain knowledge, you know, in, in between their ears and they know everybody under the sun you know, on a personal level, because they've actually traveled out and, you know, and met these people and so on. Um, how could I ever, myself, as the fourth generation B2B, you know, uh, merchant, how could I ever really replace that in the immediate or, or near term, right? All of that, you know, um, human capital. And then how can I also, and maybe more importantly, the real question is, is like, how can I unlock that? Right, because there's nothing worse than low adoption when we talk about you know introducing you know new technologies. Right, um, you know it's it's great to have you know the um, accounting and, and reporting software, but if if my field sales reps who have been there for 30 years don't sort of use it, you know what's 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 the point of it? And so what? How do we get past those the sort of you know cultural barriers that exist in you know long-standing B2B operations that are very field sales heavy, you know that that do sort of do things still on a pad and paper and you know and and we'll call kind of inefficient ways um, because I do know that one of the things that we do talk about when we do talk about e-commerce and and I say technology a lot of the time is you know the conversation can turn into inefficiencies and even maybe so far as go into, you know, soft costs, which we all understand as labor and, and these other sorts of things. So how do you thread that needle? How do you get into those, you know, hard cultural B2B accounts um, and, and sell to those folks? Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in and, and start sure. a, a little bit. Uh, I mean, I, I think this past year, I, I, I'd say the, the pandemic, the situation uh, with, with COVID um, created such a, um, an acceleration of, of technology and change to online and, and, and moving away from, uh, I guess, Dan, what you just described as that kind of classic old style, um, you know, field rep selling and uh, companies uh, having, uh, you know, them expect to show up for their appointment at 11 a.m. They're opening up the door. Everybody goes to the boardroom. You do business. Everybody goes out to lunch. Uh, I, that, I, I think that's completely changed now. I think there's going to be a portion of of business that's going to shift back to that and and maybe we'll kind of continue along those traditional lines but i can tell you that you know and i, I love a lot of these stories that we helped many kind of classic traditional companies during covid adjust their operation because you had the remote workforce set up all of a sudden where no longer were folks in the office getting mail. They weren't opening mail to open and see invoices. There wasn't, they weren't writing out checks with their check stock in the office to then have the treasurer or CFO sign the check to then put that in the mail. Uh, all of that stuff had to change into a, an online digital modern approach to uh, emailing, creating invoice payment links and things like that so that cash continued to flow. Um, and I, I guess it's just, you know, because of, of COVID, it's a little bit easier to talk about to these classic traditional businesses that they do need to change and that it can be complementary to the field sales guys that are still going to go. And by the way, they're probably going to get some benefit from that change because there's going to be more opportunities for them to have 
phone conversations or office visits or lunches and things like that. Because if you set it up right, then there's going to be more leads and reasons for them, for their expertise to come in to then talk to the next potential client that they wouldn't have gotten in the first place type of a thing. Does that make sense? It does. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, COVID is an interesting one for B2B because I would say like the number of calls that I was on with people in office during COVID were almost always B2B. Right. They were manufacturers who, if they were deemed essential, they were they were taking a call from their office, right? Because they've got a warehouse, they're making product, right? They're manufacturing, packing, shipping. They're still putting things on trucks, and so because so much of that business has a back office, right, meaning or has a manufacturing structure, uh, they were working, right? And and so the the twist that we've often taken with that is that part of this picture is psychological and some of it is techno technological, right? And that the psychology is, is often the harder one to get over. Your fourth generation example here is kind of an interesting one for a variety of reasons. One is odds are actually stacked against that fourth generation family member that they haven't squandered the business by now, right? Like the odds are actually against them, right? If by that generation to, to still be successful in a company. Sorry to be one about it, but that's just the reality, right? You fragment. Grandpa's vision too many times and with too many handholders and somebody's gonna gonna do a poor job. Uh, but that being said, right, for the ones that aren't, uh, which is awesome, right? Meaning I have huge respect for family businesses. My wife's family has a family business in Pittsburgh, not dissimilar to Scranton, although different uh, part of the state. Uh, but it's old school, right? It's chain and wire rope and lifting devices. And it's it's like, uh, you know, they're certifying the lift test on things that people die if it breaks, right? And it's it's stuff that matters. And, and there's a lot of pride in that product set, mm. right? Meaning the knowledge and the expertise that goes into a lot of these products, there's pride in that. And so part of the, the hesitancy to switch and move and be agile in business is often pride, right? Meaning, They've done it a certain way. They've done really well. They have a reputation and their people are good, right? They have a ton of experience. And so part of this is psychological, helping people understand that e-commerce doesn't have to throw all of that away, right? Our point is actually that that the person who is calling, your customer who's calling in to reorder parts or supplies or a restock, even though they like the person that they're talking to, would actually do it a different way. Like they would actually rather do it, right? When they know they have to order something at 10 o'clock at night, they forgot to order these no touch tools, right? That they're gonna be behind and stop production line because they didn't do it. You know, it would actually be better if I could just have typed it in, right? Like I'm capable, if you showed me what I ordered last time, I can just reorder. And so it's starting to change the psychology and also understand that all of the human beings in that chain of purchase, all use Amazon, all of them, right? So they, they are all already tuned to using a consumer buying pattern mm -hmm. that fits. So, so there's no like, it, you're not like shattering someone's world that they're gonna click a button with a quantity and, and put it into an order, right? And see their bill of materials. Like that's not earth shattering. They're like, yeah, of course I get that part, right? It's just doing it in the context of their business to say, wait, here's what we really mean, right? It doesn't have to be a, uh, a consumer type of shopping cart. We're building an order. We're doing reordering. We're doing restock. Oh, but we're doing restock, but now we have this opportunity to do subscription-based refill, right? You know they're always doing the same thing. And so it's like, well, how can I make your business and or your rep more effective? And it doesn't mean that you don't necessarily pay them on the orders that come through that channel. Some of the most successful B2B examples that we see where they have parallel teams, right? They have an e-commerce engine powering the ordering and they have a sales team selling and building territory and volume. They're actually paying the reps on the orders that come through from their territory. And the whole point is that they're using the e-com platform simply as a tool, right? It's, it's simply to be my always on ordering mechanism that doesn't have eight to five hours, that doesn't get sick, that doesn't, you know, miss a fax, that doesn't, you know, uh, miss label inventory or a part number, um, and that can have some intelligence baked in to do part substitution when something's out of stock, 
uh, to give actual ETA and status updates. And so it's really trying to bring forward what are the use cases that they actually feel, right? And often the things they feel are when things don't give a good customer experience, right? The order came through, but in the time the order was placed versus when they checked inventory, it was off. So the short two or three parts. Well, that sucks, right? It sucks for everybody in that chain. It sucks for the rep, sucks for the customer, sucks for the company. And instead, you're like, well, let's let's compress that. Like, let me take that pain out of the puzzle. So often it's the use cases where they see inefficiency and pain. They're not thinking those as e-commerce problems, right? Those are those tend to be like logistics problems or a data problem, right? It, and and the interesting twist is e-commerce kind of gets to pull some of those things together and say, hey, can I? If I can get better information at the point of which the person is actually going to take the action, they're going to have a better experience. We can call it e-commerce, but in all reality, we're just helping them make a business process more effective and more efficient. And then the, the psychology piece of this is like, look, that doesn't mean you don't pay your reps, right? Like, in fact, uh, in, in my book, help them go make more money, right? By like taking on more accounts and more territory and more volume. Help them be a better uh, kind of uh, uh, servant to their customer in terms of coming up with new products for them to use. Uh, but I think it's often getting the use case to not feel so foreign as e-commerce because people often think it's like, well, like I'm not publishing a consumer catalog and I'm not doing mm -hmm. you know the consumer marketing. It's like the, fine, call it what you want. Really, let's get, let's figure out the business process on there. The one exception I would say to that is marketplaces and so there's this other animal right which basically says hey if if i have products or inventory that are that is low touch say it's you know old products things i'm liquidating whatever it might be and i'm pumping that out into a marketplace that i can see as a net new channel low touch low sales rep involvement for your fourth gen uh, uh business leader that's one of those where you're like hey star this category because if, if that's something you can fill that's often like a found piece of growth for their business to simply move product right alibaba's proved that you can move you know front end loaders and backhoes and cement trucks and entire you know uh, uh cotton mills uh, through quote unquote e-commerce but if you look at what it really is it's just a big catalog where you end up talking to a rep doing some solutioning and then what do you do? Then you place your order in the platform, right? And so I think that metaphor follows a lot to how we see it. Yeah. yeah. So th I mean, that, that's that's a that's sort of a, a common refrain, you know, depending on the industry is like, well, this is just too complex of a product to to sell through e-commerce. There's just too you know too many variations and and and, and variables and so on you know involved, and so you just kind of have to have um, you know a manual process. Um, so that's that's here. The other thing you know that I, I think we've not, and Mark touched upon it is, um, is margin, right? Um, you know, we talk about margin and the ability for increased margins in, within e-commerce. Um, we also talk about growth, which which Mark mentioned, and and I'm going to use the example of um, ATMs uh, at banks, and then they started getting rolled out in the maybe the late 70s or the 80s i think you know i think i was a kid actually so um and the worry was at, at the time that it was going to you know cause a net reduction in bank tellers um and there were you know a lot of folks upset thinking that you know this this piece of automation was going to obviate you know bank tellers and actually what ended up happening was that um m there were more uh, bank tellers hired over the the next uh, decade, precisely because um, the efficiency created by the ATM and it being able to handle so many kind of like you say low touch sort of I just need forty bucks I don't need to you know taking that completely out of the bank lobby equation allowed for um, and you see bank tellers now kind of handling maybe more in depth transactions than they would of you know. Um, you know, uh, you know, a generation ago. And so it's sort of two things, right, is and one of them might seem counterintuitive that you'd be actually introducing technology to sort of replace a part of what someone's doing, but it would actually create you the ability to, to, to grow scalably, right? 
Um, and then also that, you know, e-commerce gives you the ability, um, regardless of what the field sales rep says, right, of, of increasing, even if it's on the margin, your margins for a given product, right? So that even that little bit of, um, uh, you know, digitization of the process, that has, that has a, a dollar amount to it. Now, we might not be able to quantify ourselves right now, but certainly, you know, a, a business would w would want to be able to, right? You know, we've created this increased efficiency in our process. That means, you know, X number of dollars on a year-to-year -year basis. Like, these are things that are very important. Um, the last thing that I just want to throw out is, you know, the most recent statistic about B2B buyers, right? Because we've sort of talked about, you know, the, the internal sales processes, the rep and, and their use of technology and so on. But B two B buyers at this point are, are fifty or over fifty percent millennials, um, who have really just a totally different expectation set of priorities <coughs> as consumers, as buyers, as users of technology um, than do you know folks in, in preceding in generations. So I'd like to hear the two of you just in our last like ten minutes sort of speak towards you know the counterintuitiveness right <laughs> of of, of introducing, you know, uh, a, a sales tool that would actually help your humans sort of sell more, you know, create for themselves maybe a more fulfilling experience as employees. Like I, we mentioned the bank teller handling, you know, more in-depth transactions. Um, the conversation in and around increased margins. And then I really would love to hear your guys' thoughts on, you know, what B2B companies need to do to attract and keep um, you know, uh, millennial B2B buyers. So, uh, Joe, we'll, we'll, we'll start back with you. All right. I'm going to work, uh, let's see, backwards then. That's I guess I'm going to go the buyers uh, first. I'm going to, is that all right? I'm going to attack that one because I, I think that's a one that I've, I've thought a lot about um, uh, more than maybe the other two topics. And I, I think of, um, I guess it was the, um, uh, Anderson and, and Horowitz uh, podcast there, um, A16Z, where talked about recently this one about the, um, the selling to developers and this concept of, of um, if, you, if you build out, um, if, if you choose to set the model or at least one of your sales models to be bottom up selling versus kind of this classic enterprise top-down selling um if if you set it up and especially you recognize the nature of the buyer uh to be maybe a developer um you know a a, a millennial who uh has this expectation that they're going to be able to go and research this and do everything on their own and they want to do all of the research on their own if you build out your your funnel with the right open source, the right documentation, um, the right flows, you can actually be extremely successful and efficient in, in B2B selling where the, the, the rep, um, you know, isn't as needing to spend as much time sort of early on in the sales cycle, but those buyers are coming through and getting all of the things that they need because the documentation there is there, the open source is available, they can build out the proof of concept and they can essentially create the solution on their own um, that they then are taking back to their organization and saying, hey, I know we had this gap or we needed to solve this problem. I went out and did the research and I've solved it. And here's what I'm recommending the software or the vendor or the solution that we're gonna use and it does all of these things that we need. And then the executives are like, that's, that's great. Now we just need to understand the terms of the deal and what this is gonna cost us. And, and they find, you, know, you need to finalize maybe the, the contracting at, at that point. But I think that's a very interesting philosophy here uh, related to B2B sales is, is making it so that you spend your product time and effort on basically building out better open source, better documentation for those millennial buyers so that, you know, cause their expectation is that they can do all of the research that they want online um, in a self-service fashion. 
And then you've got the value add coming in at the end with the sales team to put things together. For example, maybe they're looking at, um, and this happened recently with a, a big commerce project with a large multi-billion dollar manufacturer. They were looking at a specific launch of, of their e-stores in a certain way for their operation. This was a big initiative for them. But they also had a major problem because of COVID and the dispersed workforce related to using their existing payment gateways uh, virtual terminal for invoicing and collections and things like that. And they had a problem because the way they normally did that was in the office on a certain network and getting access to a certain set of screens. And because they were remote, that wasn't available to them. They couldn't access that Chromebook ex uh, example and screens and network. And so when they engaged me off of uh, sort of this initial research and we're like, this is what we need to do with big commerce and we're super excited and we got, you know, 20 plus stores across, uh, all over the world. And, and then we started talking about this and they said, oh, by, this, by the way, we use these other gateways for this other thing and we have these problems. And all of a sudden I was able to stitch together this classic blue snap solution where we could consolidate multiple pieces of technology. And it was that value that I really put into it. And it, and it was kind of a, it was that classic thing. They did a lot of research online ahead of time, looked at the, the details and the documentation and were sa extremely satisfied. And then all of a sudden they realized, well, wait a minute, I've got this other major issue that I can solve with blue snap as well. And I think that's kind of a, of a neat, of a neat thing that happens in, in uh, class, you know, in B2B selling. Outstanding. Yeah, Mark, we've got three minutes for your, your last thoughts on, you know, on millennials, on increasing margins and, um, you know, being able to, to grow the company by, by, you know, bringing in, you know, uh, digital assets such as e-commerce. All right, lightning, lightning finish. So, lightning uh, in terms of the the increase of growth, like it doesn't matter if you're family owned, PE backed, VC backed, everyone loves growth, and so the the idea to be able to use technology to be able to grow, I think, is fundamental. And, and so that's the the scenario you paint is actually a really interesting one because it's those type of people, like this next generation of business owner, are the ones who are looking at technology as ways and unlocking ways to grow. And so for sure, there's some step function growth opportunities by uh, without having to radically reshape the entire business itself, right? It doesn't have to move from B2B to B2, to B2C in order to be successful in using technology. I think in terms of margin, you know, one of the interesting things we have seen as a, an effect of COVID was manufacturers uh, debating their distributor channel, right? And how to work with distributors when distributors are holding inventory, but maybe uh, not selling quite as much or pulling through as much volume. But now they've started taking orders from areas they never planned. Right? So we had manufacturers that were taking global international orders for products that they only sold regionally. And they're like, well, wait, now I can actually sell this product to somebody in Dubai, right? Like it, it's really not that different, right? The truck's still going to come pick it up. It leaves my dock. It just doesn't go to the the distributor 150 miles away it's going on a you know a container that's going to go to the middle east right and and that that may not be as different or radical as it sounds and so there's some interesting things there i think about you know the relative margin there's margin and or addressable market to be had there in terms of restructuring some of these things to joe's point about margin using technology that also opens up new capabilities is also where margin can be found so, right, if they can collect funds faster, if they offer new payment options, right, there are a whole set of things that then they can simply just turn on for their customers that, in effect, give them a much better operating profit in the business. It's pretty interesting, right, that that can be a business decision, not one that's heavy technology. And then the last one, in terms of the buyer, it's about giving a great experience, right? So, so the expectation of that buyer is actually to have a rivaled consumer level quality of experience in their buying process. And that doesn't necessarily, we always kind of think, well, does it have to look really slick and look amazing? Look, like user experience aside, right? Yes, it should look great, but it doesn't necessarily have to be high glossy like you're doing a high-end fashion brand. But 
but should it include some of the things that you come to expect as an e-commerce or as a modern consumer, like great email communication? Yeah, for sure, right? Uh, should it have really interesting, uh, you know, cross marketing or, or merchandising or product suggestions? Yeah, maybe, right? Depending on the product set. And so there's some really interesting things there, I think that as a buyer, you value the experience you're getting in a digital channel and we're now tuned to it, right? We've all spent the last year and a half, right? A uh, year and a few months heavily using e-com, right? Everyone. And, and so I think that's set a good bar for saying, hey, let's use and bring some of those experience elements into the process by which we're doing transactions and marketing and merchandising and expanding our product catalog to affect uh, people's buying behavior. Because it's still, at the end of the day, it's still a human being on the other end of that screen. I guess they may be doing it at business hours for a business purpose. It's still a human being that we're trying to get to act. That's right. What a great final word. And thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for, for joining us today. Uh, Joe Chor and Mark Ostriniak from Blue Snap and Big Commerce, uh, respectively. That ends our uh, digital commerce today, the great debates of 2021, uh, an outstanding final panel. And thanks so much for the discussion, really, to all our partners today from Impact, Lever to La excuse me, Lever.io, Hotjar, of course, Big Commerce and Blue Snap, Shopify Plus, Hawk Media, Catapult, and WP Engine. Really just an outstanding roster of, uh, of brands, of product developers, of people. Um, super to have, uh, super excited to have had all of you, um, you know, involved today. And, and we thank you so much. We've got uh, a little networking uh, speed dating type of thing going on for the next half hour, which is the next session. Um, I think though that this topic in particular, as I said at the top, is is, is really very relevant for all of us in and around um, e-commerce and, and one that I would love to pick up again, um, you know, perhaps on uh, on the Hard Truths of B2B podcast uh, with Isaiah and, and Tim Peterson. I think this would be an absolutely fan fantastic uh, podcast um, episode. So good one. And to Joe, thanks you guys so much again, and, and to all our participants, and, and for all the people who joined us today, thank you so much. Kudos, Dan. Great job. Thanks, Dan. Much appreciated. Absolutely. Thanks again, guys. Great work, Joe. Thanks. See you over in networking, folks. Cheers. Yeah.